Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, internet, internet regulation, state authoritarianism, and um, the public sphere, the online public sphere in Turkey. And this uh, draws um, from a larger project that is my upcoming book, um, hopefully in um, spring 2016, um, from University of Illinois Press. And um, your feedback is especially welcome. I'm putting the final touches on the manuscript. Um, and this is also um, kind of an offshoot of uh, other, you know, like a, a few other related projects about um, digital activism in um, Turkey. So um, just to get started, I want to, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, like recent headlines in international media, you know, like New York Times, Guardian, um, and whatnot. Usually the headlines we see is, you know, like uh, social media plays a major role in Turkey protests, referring to the Gezi Park protests in um, 2013. Uh, and then last year, Turkey's Twitter crackdown, the new internet, internet law, and Erdogan's tightening the screws on internet and similar, you know, like this kind of uh, dichotomy between, you know, like the immense battery potential of um, social media, especially in terms of the protests, and then the authoritarian detour or the so-called authoritarian slide of the um, Turkish government or the AKP government. Um, so a lot of popular and also the emerging scholarly analysis have been focusing on um, these, you know, questions. Are, are social media effective? Um, or is, does it have revolutionary potential? Uh, what about its instrumental value? And um, I am um, arguing um, that um, the, the, the burgeoning online public sphere um, is not necessarily a post Gezi development uh, because social media and digital activism in Turkey, um, yes, they have been burgeoning and they have kind of taken off, especially um, during and after the events of Gezi protests in 2013, but there's also a, a broader historical context to it. Um, likewise, the government crackdown or the so-called authoritarian slide, and I say so-called authoritarian slide, Slide, not just because uh, I'm not arguing that it's not not authoritarian it is but this is not necessarily a slide Turkish state and Turkish public sphere and political system has almost always been um, authoritarian so, so to, to say that it is an authoritarian slide is to assume that oh they were democratic now what happened and is also to assume that you know like once we get rid of Erdogan things will go back to normal um, so that's um, also one of the um, the issues that I take up in, in, in the book. Um, so um, going back to the government crackdown, um, what I'm saying is that this is not necessarily a knee-jerk reaction by Erdogan or um, the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, um, to either the Gezi protests or the corruption scandal that rocked the government um, in 2014. Um, so I'm rather interested in looking at these um, entrenched social, political, cultural um, structures and the underlying um, factors that, you know, like, um, that is about intolerance of dissent and not just online, also offline. Um, and um, I am also uh, pointing out to how the state authoritarianism in Turkey is not necessarily the exception, but has always been the rule. Um, so um, in this talk, I want to give a brief overview of these you know, um, interconnected, interlinked um, areas, if you like. I want to look at a little bit of the historical development of the networked public sphere in Turkey, online sphere, um, its relationship to larger media system, um, and also its relationship to uh, broader political and cultural um, factors. Um, so um, as I said, um, the burgeoning online activism is not necessarily uh, a new development that's happening after 2013 because uh, especially with Gezi protests, um, there have been, you know, like some pronouncements such as, you know, like, oh, the revolution will not be televised, but it will be Twittered. Um, or, oh, is this, you know, like um, Turkey's Tahrir Square or is it the Turkish Spring or better, is it Turkish Summer? Um, and <laughs> hopefully, you know, like all these statements were, you know, like, um, I'm sorry. I knew I was going to do this, just, all right, microphone, is it okay? All right, um, so, um, 
obviously there has been a, a thriving internet culture in Turkey um, at least since mid um, 1990s. Um, commercial internet has been commercially available since 1993. Um, some sources put it at 1995, so there's a little bit of uncertainty there. Um, but currently, the internet penetration, um, according to the latest available data that I was uh, able to find, um, it's at 45 percent. Um, so there are approximately 35 million users, and considering the country population at 77 million, um, that's uh, fairly good. Um, and 70 percent of these users, um, and these are the data I gathered from World Bank Comscore and Statista, um, 70 percent of them are under the age of 35. Um, 93 percent have a Facebook account, um, 72 percent have a Twitter account. Turkey is the fourth largest country in Facebook use uh, and the eighth largest in Twitter use. Um, and again, the Twitter use, um, um, Turks did not discover Twitter overnight during the Gezi protests, uh, but there has certainly been this, you know, like spike. Um, and other popular platforms are YouTube, Instagram, Vine, um, LinkedIn. Uh, there are, you know, like uh, various blogs, news sites, and online forums on, you know, like anything and everything from fashion, politics, um, to parenting, um, and gourmet food. Um, so I want to um, talk a little bit about um, the, the recent civic initiatives um, that have to do with, you know, like um, that, that are digitally enabled. Um, and maybe you're familiar with 140 journos. Um, so this is an online citizen journalism slash activist group. They do not necessarily um, define themselves as journalists or citizen journalists, uh, but they call themselves, um, and this is from their um, 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 homepage, they call themselves uh, a news agency that belongs to the people. Um, Obviously, 140 journos because of the 140 character limit of Twitter. Um, they started out um, on Twitter in January 2012, way before Gezi protests. So it was a core, uh, core team of seven um, youngsters, uh, a couple of university students, software programmers, and activists. And um, they developed 140 journals in response to the media blackout back in 2012 when um, Turkish army jets killed 34 Kurdish villagers. And there was this total media blackout on Turkish news media for 12 hours, um, almost 12 hours, no major news channel in Turkey reported on the story. Um, so 140 journals. Um, they launched this, uh, this news, quote unquote, news agency in response to this blackout. And then they started uh, uh, tweeting from you know, protests, street rallies, um, court hearings, where journalists were not allowed. Um, they just you know, like snuck in, and they were tweeting about these uh, political court hearings. Um, and during Gezi protests, 140 journals just you know, like, took off. It became the go-to site uh, for protesters, for those wanting to uh, know what was going on um, at Gezi and you know, like in other uh, Gezi protests spread to, whole to the whole country. There were uh, about, I think, 2,000 or 3,000 uh, separate protests in about 70 uh, provinces of Turkey, except for one. Um, so um, the protesters started sending, you know, like, um, in images to 140 journals, um, such as this one. This is, you know, like, Taksim Square under um, uh, police uh, gas. Um, and their tweets increased in two weeks um, from about 400 to over 2,000. Followers shoot up from 8,000 to 45,000. And right now, um, they have about 55,000 followers. And the team of volunteers increased to 3,000. But the core team is still in charge of you know, like aggregating, verifying, and categorizing the content generated by the volunteers. Uh, one core team member um, is actually a doctoral student in Columbia um, Journalism School. And I um, talked to her, and I talked to uh, a few others. And they insist that you know, like they are all about information. So they just want to verify, aggregate, and just the facts, um, and nothing else. Um, so they are also in the process of developing an application because they want to be able to geotag where the tweets are coming from um, and embed it with background information. Um, another civic initiative um, that emerged, um, and this was right before the local elections in March 2014, 
uh, was um, in, in Turkish, it's oyve ötesid, I can, you know, like lose a translate as, as vote and beyond. These were, these were, you know, like a group of eight volunteers in Istanbul who started reaching out to public via Twitter and Facebook. And um, this is their Facebook page. Um, and what I wanted to do was to increase the voter, voter turnout. And because there were rumors about, you know, like, oh, the AKP is going to rig the elections, the local elections, et cetera, they wanted to make sure that they, you know, like, were at the polling stations as monitors um, and verify the uh, voting tallies and whatnot. So they were able to enlist close to 30,000 individuals in Istanbul alone who um, on the day of the elections monitored 95% of the stations in Istanbul. Um, this um, um, uh, form of this, you know, like digitally enabled civic activism um, also carried over to the presidential elections in August 2014 when um, Erdogan uh, was elected the um, president. And um, other initiatives emerged such as um, Sandık Başındayız, and loosely translated, we are at the polls, like we're monitoring the polls, and Turkey's votes and lo its local branches in six cities, like Ankara's votes, Istanbul's votes, and, and so on. They organized um, about 10,000 volunteers so that they could work as, you know, like um, ballot box monitors. They posted uh, very, you know, like slickly produced YouTube training videos, you know, like brochures and whatnot about how to report um, if there was any um, um, electoral fraud. Uh, and they even set up 1-800 numbers um, if the um, volunteers needed assistance. So this is uh, the group of uh, the core team of volunteers in Ankara. Um, so on the day of the presidential elections, they were they met at the you know like at one of the uh, offices, um, and they were just you know like at their computers, phones, helping out um, the um, volunteers. So a lot of times, um, and I'm just you know like highlighting these two examples. One more gears towards you know like citizen journalism, and the other more towards you know like. Um, direct engagement, you know, like in, in, in the um, voting process and taking responsibility. This is what the Turkish, you know, like these volunteers emphasize a lot. You know, like we need to take responsibility now. Um, so um, a lot of times, um, considering the fact that, you know, like thousands of websites are blocked in Turkey, you know, people get prosecuted for the tweets they, po they post. The question that I get is, you know, like, wait, how come does, you know, like, how come the AKP government, you know, like, lets these folks be, you know, like, they're not touching 140 journals, they're not touching, you know, like, these voting, you know, like, uh, monitoring um, initiatives, volunteers and whatnot. So um, a, a couple of um, answers. Probably the AKP does not find them threatening because it has entrenched as, you know, like, hegemony so, you know, like, firmly. Um, it could also be using them as, you know, like safety valves, just so these, you know, like anti-government activists um, and they're, these volunteers um, or citizen journalists, they, they tend to come from, you know, like anti-AKP uh, political uh, backgrounds. So maybe they're, they're just letting them be so they can express their frustration online and do not organize mass protests, do not take out to the streets. Or the AKP is just explode, ex, uh, exploiting their presence so they can just go ahead and say, you know, like, hey, look, we let these guys be. We're not touching them. They can say anything. They can do anything. They're, you know, like monitoring the polls. We have nothing to fear. So it's maybe it's just using them to ward off any criticism that comes from um, the Western policymakers. Um, so um, one important um, um, point um, that I want to make is um, I'm not really in favor of, you know, like looking at um, 140 journals or, you know, like Turkey's votes or, you know, like all these um, civic initiatives and, of course, others, you know, like news sites, um, online forums. And um, I'm not looking at them and evaluating their potential to um, dismantle this existing power structure. Um, I rather want to focus on the creative and insurgent capacities. And this I draw from um, Nabila Chaibi's work as well as uh, Mariam Ora's and Alexander's work about you know, um, the um, Egyptian revolution and, and Twitter. Um, so they both argue that they create spaces of dissent. 
right? And so these are in, in Turkey perhaps isolated and very small pockets of dissent. Uh, but I think the very fact that they exist um, so far <laughs> um, are, are noteworthy, are significant, especially against the broader media and political system. So this is what I want to um, look at next. Um, the, the broader political um, and media system in Turkey, as you know, like you're probably well aware, are, are, are very restricted um, and are subject to a lot of state control and um, authoritarian imperatives. Um, so until um, you know, like 2013, perhaps until the Gezi protests um, and throughout the you know, like the the that decade. Um, what Turkey did, what the state did, um, was to focus on first and second generation control. Um, that I uh, draw from Diebert and Rozanski's uh, work when they you know, like, um, look at how internet controls, how state controls are used in different national contexts. So until 2007, Turkey did not have any internet legislation. Um, the government, um, the AKP, they came to power in 2002. They, you know, like mostly kept, you know, like they adopted this hands-off approach to internet. And only in two cases, they prosecuted two individuals. And in that case, they applied press law um, provisions. <coughs> um, but in 2007, um, the AKP dominated parliament passed the first internet law. Um, it's the official title of, oops, let me not trip on this. The official title of the law is um, Regulation of Publications on the Internet and Suppression of Crimes Committed by Means of Such Publications. Um, so um, this was partly a response by the AKP lawmakers to the increasing fears about the internet and internet use, and especially by Turkish youth. Um, increasingly, you know, like using the internet, and in most cases, unsupervised. So, um, if you look at, you know, like media coverage, uh, th those years, there are a lot of stories about how these teenagers uh, got involved with satanic groups online. You know, um, they were being subject to a lot of sexual and explicit content. You know, like um, they were driven to using illegal substances because of, you know, like their internet addiction. Um, so um, the punishable crimes listed in the law had to do with the online displays of obscenity, sexual abuse of children, suicide, prostitution, gambling, drug abuse. And um, they also threw in um, the slandering of the legacy of Ataturk. <laughs> um, but this, um, I think this, this is important because the internet law did not have to do with only, you know, like, um, the AKPs and, you know, like conservative segments of, you know, like Islam inspired values, but also the nationalist sentiment. So the two go hand in hand, um, go hand in hand. And um, Jenny White has a, a great book, which uh, she calls it, you know, like Muslim nationalism. So it's not about, and again, this is one of the points that I'm making in the book. It's not, when we talk about, you know, like the, the, the Turkish case, the, the media and political systems, a lot of times we kind of, um, are, are trapped by these binary um, oppositions, you know, like Islamism versus secularism um, and, and, and whatnot. But it's, you know, like a, a lot more complex than that. And I think the intersection of um, these Islam-inspired conservative values with ethnic na nationalism, Turkish ethnic nationalism, that's very um, interesting. Um, so going back to um, um, what was happening in, in the 2000s, um, so Obviously, as you know, like first and second generation controls, we have the restrictive um, government, um, um, the, the, the legislation. Um, Turkish Telecom Authority, TIB, uh, the Turkish acronym, um, took on extensive, you know, like filtering and um, blocking. Um, and courts and police, uh, you know, like began making requests to um, foreign companies, online, you know, like um, companies, website operators and whatnot, also local ones for content removal. Uh, there's a list of certain words that are banned from Turkish na um, domain names. Uh, it's a list of, you know, like 130 words. Um, and instead of blocking specific content, um, Turkish authorities usually want, you know, like wholesale ban. So this is the, you know, like the infamous YouTube ban between 2007 and 2010. Uh, they banned, you know, like a uh, wholesale ban, you know, like YouTube because of about five or six videos that uh, depicted Ataturk as a 
as a gay man. They were posted by Greek users, and there was this, you know, like online kind of skirmish between Greek and Turkish YouTube users. And Turkish pers persecutors said, "Oh, this hurts Turks' sensitivities." Um, because Turks are very sensitive. Um, this hurts our sensitivities. So they asked YouTube um, to remove uh, the videos, not only in Turkey, but globally. And YouTube said, you know, like Google said, um, no, we're only going to remove them um, in Turkey. And then the court said, OK, we're shutting down YouTube. But of course, uh, people, you know, like uh, savvy users found ways to circumvent. And soon enough, you know, like this, you know, like circulated online. Um, and everyone was on YouTube, so the ban was not really effective. And at one point, Erdogan even himself said, you know, like, oh, I access YouTube, you can too. This was at the time of the ban. So um, other, you know, like um, user-generated sites such as Vimeo, Dailymotion, MySpace, MetaCafe, um, at one point Google services like Google Docs, um, they were also banned intermittently. Um, so this is, you know, like um, 2007, 2010. Um, Can you go back to the sure. How different are those from the regulations on the regular media? In other words, <coughs> slandering legacy of editor, suicide, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Yes, is this, um, just this is online offline comparability, or is it um, well? Uh, they are very comparable to you know like um, print. Uh, I'm sorry, press law, uh, the broadcasting law. So um, anything that is you know like. Um, uh, obscene or, uh, you know, like um, slandering the legacy of Ataturk or um, offending Turkishness, um, national Turkish identity, that is also in the press law, or spreading terrorist propaganda. So if you uh, print anything that uh, is allegedly supportive of the PKK, um, then you could be accused of, you know, like spreading terrorist propaganda. Um, online or offline. So um, the internet law, and again, uh, I think that's another important point, the, the, um, the state authoritarianism or this government pro, um, crackdown is not really medium specific. That's why I'm also looking at the broader media system. This is very much aligned with the existing press law, uh, broadcasting law, and where they cannot apply these laws, then they turn to other specific legislation. We have a law that um, that bans the um, slandering and offending the legacy and memory and reforms of Ataturk, the law number something. Uh, so then they turn to that. If that doesn't work, they use penal code provisions. If that doesn't work, we have the anti-terror law. So the, 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 the net is very wide. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Okay, so um, currently there are 65,000 uh, 65, websites that are blocked in Turkey. Um, this, uh, is, this figure is not released by the government, but it's crowdsourced by um, Engelli Web, which is, translates into disabled web. Uh, so they're crowdsourcing and verifying you know, um, the number of sites that are uh, blocked. Um, the last time the government agency TIB released figures was back in 2009. So this is very, very, you know, like non-transparent. And back in 2009, they put that number at 3,700. And even then, the internet activists estimated it to be, you know, like about uh, 5,000. Um, so um, the breakdown of these, you know, like blocking decisions, 6.8% uh, is done by the courts. Um, and 93% is done by the government agency. So this is pretty much, you know, like um, AKP proxy. Um, less than 1% is blocked for child pornography, 90% about obscenity, 10% online gambling and copyright infringement. Um, but there is this, you know, like more than 1,000, you know, 1,300 websites and the blocking decision is not known. Um, so. Uh, the interesting thing is, you know, like a, a lot of times people think that, you know, like, oh, it's all political speech that is banned. But it's not. Actually, we see that they are really concerned with, you know, like um, obscenity and sexual content. Uh, but of course, this doesn't mean that political speech is not restricted. Um, I will be talking about that in a little while. Um, Sites are blocked, but there's always circum circumvention. Um, savvy internet users, as I said before, they you know like um, share this information about how to use you know like VPNs, change their DSNs, and um, during Gizi and um, last year's Twitter and YouTube bans in 2014, um, there were all these you know like stories that my friends were sharing. You know like so if 
um, say, in an apartment building with like 10, 12 families, if there was one young savvy internet user, you know, like all the neighbors would be knocking on his door and, you know, like, come and show us, you know, like how to, you know, like figure out this VPN thing. Um, so the, the, the joke was that, you know, like, oh, the youngsters are now helping the grandmas. Um, but um, even when last year the Twitter and YouTube uh, were banned, you know, like there was the sudden spike in, you know, like um, new Twitter accounts being open and the number of tweets, you know, like um, shooting up. So it's not effective. It's more like this, you know, like whack-a-mole kind of thing with, um, with the government. Um, the interesting thing that's been happening since um, Gizzi and more so during, you know, like in 2014 when the corruption scandal um, rocked um, the AKP government, they have been moving towards what Debert and Rosansky called the third generation controls. So there is more um, online surveillance. Um, they're moving towards um, not the, you know, like the formal information campaign, uh, but um, after Gizzi, um, the AKP created a Twitter army to kind of shape the, you know, like the, the online discourse, especially on Twitter. Of course, this is really, you know, like um, a, a, a predicament for the AKP because on one hand, they are trying to portray Twitter and Facebook um, and other social media platforms as these, you know, malicious foreign agents that are tearing at our social unity and that are threatening our, you know, like national unity and, and, and whatnot. On the other hand, they're very active on um, Twitter. When Twitter was banned um, last year, um, a lot of AKP ministers were still tweeting. They were actually tweeting the, the news of the Twitter ban. Um, <laughs> so, um, and um, right after um, Gezi protest, um, the AKP realized, I think, you know, like the power of social media, and then they created their own um, Twitter army, which is very similar to Klishan uses this term. Kremlin's bro uh, blogger army. So they're called Uktrolls because, you know, like the AKP initials. Um, there is, I think, about six to 9,000 of them. Um, and there are also hundreds of, you know, like bots on Twitter that are linked to um, AKP youth organizations. Um, also the loyalist journalists uh, that are pro-Erdogan. Um, they're very active on um, Twitter. So there's usually this, you know, like, uh, it's kind of this, this back and forth um, or this kind of like battleground thing going on between um, the pro-AKP um, and the AKP um, um, uh, posters. Um, you're probably familiar with the, um, the Twitter and YouTube bans um, last year. This happened right before um, the local elections when the corruption scandal erupted in um, December 2013, and there were all these, you know, like leaked conversations circulating on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and, and SoundCloud. Um, and these tapes were, you know, like conversations, you know, of, of Erdogan between his, you know, like um, family members, loyalists, uh, party officials, and, and, and businessmen. Uh, their authenticity has not been confirmed, but it has not been denied either. So. Um, it is pretty much, pretty much um, taken for a fact that they, they are authentic. So um, the TIB, government agency, um, cited a court order um, and it used some um, complaints filed by citizens. Um, one of them was a woman who said, you know, like, who complained um, and asked, you know, like, um, certain Twitter uh, post to be removed because she said, you know, like her identity had been stolen, her image was circulating on porn sites or on Twitter, which Erdogan used um, to, again, you know, like demonize Twitter. Um, Zeynep Tufekci uses this, um, um, this, this term and he said, we now have a court order based on this individual complaint. And he said, we will eradicate Twitter. I don't care what the international community says. Everyone will witness, will witness the power of the Turkish Republic. So th again, this was the intersection of, um, oh, Turkish, you know, like family values or morals, you know, sexual content and um, the, the, the nationalistic, you know, um, discourse. Um, And interestingly, uh, around the same time, Erdogan's wife, you know, in her public speech, just started talking about internet addiction, how bad it is for the Turkish family. And there's also this obscure, I came across this one um, last year, there's this, this study um, conducted by um, 
academics um, um, that apparently uh, established this causation between um, the use, internet use, and their, you know, like alcohol consumption and drug consumption, um, drug use. Um, so I'm, I'm just waiting to, you know, like um, hear some government official go back and, you know, like reference that so-called, you know, like academic um, study. But, you know, there is this increasing um, reference to, you know, like, oh, internet is, you know, like really bad. It's harming our society, our national moral values, et cetera, et cetera, and likening it to, you know, like drugs and um, alcohol. But again, um, the government is in, is in this predicament because um, Turkey's banking system, the economic system, is highly, highly integrated with financial capital markets um, at a global level, and it very much relies on, you know, like all these online communication infrastructures. So there is not going to be any Mubarak-style shutdown. Um, they cannot afford to do that, so they are just using these, you know, like different strategies. Um, also, um, interestingly, um, it was the AKP, uh, after it came to power, developed this um, a highly effective e-government system. Um, it is ranked very highly among other European governments, um, e-government services from, you know, like healthcare, uh, you know, like passport applications, what have you. Um, so um, going back to um, the, the third generation controls, yes, um, they are trying to shape the, uh, the discourse uh, by developing and, and you know, like, uh, um, by way of establishing this Twitter army. Um, also, we see uh, stricter government legislation, and this is the new internet law passed last year, February 2014. Um, so in this case, it gives, um, the, there will be really no need for any court decision to block a website. It will directly come from the government agency, TIP. And if you know, someone goes and complains about libel or privacy invasion, without obtaining a court order, they will ask the ISPs um, to carry out the blocking decision within four hours. Uh, and the first internet law in, that was passed in 2007, this was 24 hours. So four hours is um, it's pretty scary. <laughs> um, another important thing that goes back to you know like how they are um, engaging in more warrantless surveillance, they also require the ISPs to collect data on users and um, to turn this information to the government agencies um, on demand. Um, they um, also passed a new intelligence law, which again increases the surveillance powers of um, the MIT, uh, this is the Turkish acronym for National Intelligence um, Agency. Uh, basically, um, the National Intelligence Agency will be able to go to, you know, any public or private institution, schools, banks, hospitals, um, and, and um, ISPs without a court order and ask for um, personal data. Um, so this is, of course, very, very... Uh, discouraging and frustrating for a lot of political activists. Um, they are considering amendments to press law. Um, again, this goes back to Monroe's question. This is, you know, like, uh, and this is why I'm looking at the broader media system because this is not just about, you know, like, the internet. So they're also making changes in the press law and they're going to include a new provision about online news sites. Um, but it is deliberately um, very vague, you know, like what is an online news site? And it is deliberately vague so that they can apply this um, to blogs and even online commentary. Um, and again, based on provisions such as, you know, like spreading terrorist propaganda, threatening national security and whatnot, um, they will be able to um, prosecute these, you know, individuals. Um, they will also ask these online news sites, so even if you're a blogger, they will ask you to include a masthead with publisher, managing director, and all this, you know, like hosting provider information. This will, of course, you know, like um, increase the financial and administrative burdens and will very much likely um, dissuade a lot of people um, from, you know, like maintaining an online existence. Because in Turkey, um, bureaucracy and red tape, especially, you know, like applying to the government to get this, you know, like masthead or permission is, is very, very uh, uh, burdensome. Um, just uh, last week, I think, um, 
they made a new proposal. Um, so they're thinking, hey, why go to TIB, the telecom authority? Why not have the prime minister or minister's blog websites? Um, so this is under consideration. Um, and um, they said they are especially concerned about, you know, like national security or public order. What if a website, you know, like threatens public order or national um, safety or, or security? So let's give the prime minister or the ministers um, the ability to block them. This is under consideration, but given the fact that the AKP dominates the parliament and whatever proposals they make, they pretty much, you know, like ram it through the parliament, uh, it's very likely to um, pass. Um, the removal requests are increasing. Um, so, in as much as, you know, like, um, I'm, I'm critical of, of the AKP government, uh, but I think we also need to pay attention to how Twitter and Facebook, how much they comply with these requests. So Twitter recently started, you know, like, uh, applying country withheld content. Um, they're blocking um, a lot of um, tweets, especially by journalists and political activists. Um, they are blocking um, accounts. Um, and also a couple of weeks ago, um, when um, the, uh, uh, the TIB, the government agency, made requests to Facebook to remove um, any content about Prophet Muhammad um, cartoons. Not the cartoons themselves, but any content relating to the cartoons. Facebook quickly um, complied. Um, and Facebook, you know, like um, also complies with any um, request from the government or the uh, or the courts about any um, Kurdish um, um, so-called separatist content. So a lot of websites that feature, say, um, you know, like Kurdish politicians, Kurdish political community, even Kurdish music, um, that are readily they are readily blocked by um, Facebook. Um, until you know, like a few weeks ago, well. It's been more than a few weeks, maybe a month. But um, I was looking at, you know, like Liebert and Rosinski's third generation and controls, and I was thinking warrantless surveillance, check. Stricter legislation, check. And, you know, like, um, uh, designing or, or shaping the, uh, the national conversation, Twitter army, check. And the only thing, you know, like that I didn't check was targeting individuals, if not physically, right, by way of persecution, because that's, you know, like something... I always thought, you know, like, okay, so Russia is doing this. Maybe we'll, we're not going to go there. We're not there yet, right? N but um, that happened too. Um, unfortunately, nothing surprises me about Turkey anymore. But uh, a few weeks ago, a Dutch journalist uh, based in Turkey who writes about the PKK and the Kurdish peace process, um, she was detained um, by the police um, and then released after a couple of hours because of tweets she posted about um, um, the Kurdish issue. Uh, but now um, charges are brought against her, so the trial is going to begin, and um, the, the, the prosecutors are asking for a five-year prison sentence. Um, a former TV presenter, um, she, um, she's also being um, charged, for, uh, charged with threatening and harassing a public prosecutor based on her tweets. Um, and first they asked for five years for threatening the prosecutor, and then they asked for another five years because she kept the police waiting at her door. Um, so she interfered with police work. So her trial is going to begin in April. Um, and earlier, um, maybe you're familiar with Fazıl Say. He's the world-famous Turkish pianist. Two years ago, uh, he was prosecuted for tweeting um, um, for, for tweeting that uh, something that uh, allegedly offended um, the religion of Islam and the hurt the sensitivities of, of Muslims. Um, he was cleared. Uh, two other individual users uh, were also um, charged with um, similar, uh, you know, like offending religious sensitivities. So there is again that you know like intersection of um, Turkish nationalism. Um, and Islam-inspired conservative values and religious sensitivities. A lot of times, you know, like when these individuals, like Fazıl Say and those two other um, citizens, um, <clears throat> then <clears throat> they obviously didn't go to prison. But I think that the, these um, rather serve as, you know, like sticks um, to kind of um, silence um, dissent. Um, so whether it works or not, um, 
we do not really know. Again, as I said, there is, you know, like this burgeoning um, online community, uh, which goes back to at least 1990s, early 2000s, so it's not necessarily a new development. But they're always, they always find themselves in this kind of tussle with, uh, with the state actors, which also is not new, uh, which also goes back to at least, you know, like um, the post-1980 period. And um, overall, the... Um, the, the point that I'm making in the book and also, you know, like that applies to, to my work is this um, <clears throat> kind of this confluence of several different factors, um, neoliberalization and globalization um, that has come to, you know, like shape Turkish political economy in the post-1980 uh, era and also the very, you know, like entrenched state authoritarianism and state-centric political culture. So I'm not necessarily saying, you know, the, obviously the state role is dwindling because now it's a global era, we're all interconnected. As a matter of fact, Turkish state is becoming, you know, like stronger and stronger. So uh, for me, that that intersection of, you know, like um, those, those forces and the state's um, shifting or mutating role in terms of, you know, like how to maintain its ideological hegemony um, when so many, you know, like um, um, developments economically, culturally, and especially in terms of, you know, like communications are taking um, place. Because it's also in this predicament where, you know, like the economy is, is very much um, shaped along neoliberal principles, uh, but also um, politically it's geared towards um, illiberalism, uh, which um, some scholars are calling authoritarian neoliberalism. So that's, uh, that's the intersection that I'm um, um, looking at. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi, people. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for the presentation. Thank you. And I'm interested to hear you talk about the role of private companies. Uh, in supporting the state initiative mm -hmm. or regulation by complying with government's requests for data. I was wondering whether there are also private companies that directly profit from the surveillance scheme by providing technical support for the government. For instance, in the case of China, what we found is that there's an emerging data mining industry mm -hmm. that supply uh, the hardware and data analytics to the government to help them identify opinion leaders mm -hmm. or target uh, of public opinion online, even provide uh, social media campaign services mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. the government. So I was mm -hmm. wondering whether there are similar industries. Um, yes, uh, I do not have the um, hard data on that because uh, not because it doesn't exist. Because well, it's it's very hard to. Uh, dig for this kind of information. It's very, very secretive. But a lot of um, internet activists in Turkey have been writing about um, this um, um, company. I think it's Europe-based form, P-H-O-R-M, P-H-O-R-M, um, that is d doing a lot of data mining um, on behalf of the government. They deny this. They say that it's, you know, like basically doing um, ad sales and ad tracking and cookies and, and whatnot. Uh, but on a on um, certain cases, I've seen activists uh, show the linkages between, you know, like forms, um, trackings, and how it links back to um, certain, you know, like um, government systems. So that that is something to, that, that it is going on. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't know because, like I said, information on this does, is not there, is not readily available. Um, there might just as well be, you know, like Turkish companies, local companies doing the a lot of, you know, like um, tagging and, you know, like um, tracking on behalf of the Turkish government uh, or as contractors. But we just don't, we don't know. There's because there's no information, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Early in your presentation, you're talking about 140 journos beginning to tag in geo state, mm -hmm. uh, and so it seemed to me to go both ways. That is, say, the more information yes. is provided, the more surveillance is possible. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, so, so the volunteers who work for 100 for the journals, um, they are also, you know, like taking on certain risks uh, by by tweeting, you know, like pictures or information from protest rallies and, and, and whatnot. But the purpose of 100 for the journals by geotagging is, you know, like, okay, is this authentic? Um, is this picture, you know, like really happening right then and there where they say they are? Because during Gezi protests, there were some unfortunate um, episodes of misinformation. Um, and they, because 
of the barrage of tweets that were being posted during the protest, they were not able to, not only 100 for the journals, but others too, they were not able to verify the authenticity of, of, of the messages or of the pictures. So to geotag for them is to authenticate the geographical, you know, like position, um, that it's coming from, you know, like reliable sources. This is one of their volunteers. But yes, you know, uh, it is also a, a, a method of, um, not you know like malicious or intentional surveillance of of the volunteers, but there's obviously that that dimension to it. Two quick smaller questions mm -hmm. about things in your presentation, and then sort of a bigger question about an area mm -hmm. you didn't go into. One, um, would you agree or disagree that one reason the government doesn't worry that much about the poll watching organizations is that they've already penetrated them with intelligence, and so they know what's going on, and if yeah. anything dangerous happens, they'll swoop down. That's one question. Um, second, given that the Chinese are now attacking the VPNs, uh, doing something that you seem to think the Turkish government won't do because it will upset business, uh, do you think that might be coming sooner than you think because mm -hmm. they seem to be watching the Chinese and the Russian model and adopting a lot of things. Yes. So those are two. But my bigger uh, question, and I realize you're probably not an expert on the military, I think mm -hmm. this is something that puzzles a lot of people in Washington. Mm -hmm. Why has the Turkish military become so quiescent? In other words, in the old days they'd shut down a party because it mm -hmm. wasn't secular enough and so on. Is it that they have, the government has successfully wiped out any oppositional powers within the army mm -hmm. so that it would have to be a colonel who took over rather than a general? Mm -hmm. um, because I know that there are people who expected the military to do something at some point, but they never have, mm -hmm. as this slide has taken place. Yes. Uh, let me start with the military question, and then I'll um, work backwards. Um, I, I don't know if you're aware with um, two or three major uh, political investigations that happened, you know, like in 2007, 2008. So Ergenekon, um, Sledgehammer, um, that's the English name. Um, um, so uh, these were um, political investigations into what is allegedly referred to as in Turkey as the deep state. So it's this, you know, like dark, murky network of state officials, mafia bosses, you know, like military generals, kind of doing the state's dirty work. And this was in the 1990s. Um, deep state was responsible for a lot of, you know, like killings of Kurdish uh, politicians, activists, you know, PKK, uh, and 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 whatnot. So Ergenekon and Sledgehammer um, investigations started um, to uncover this deep state, so that Turkey could, you know, like further democratize and you know get rid of this this murky, dark force. Um, but it took on, obviously, part of this, you know, like, murky network is, is the military. Now, I'm personally, um, I'm, everyone is pretty much, you know, like, uh, everyone pretty much agrees that, yes, there is a deep state in Turkey. Uh, but while Ergenekon and Sledgehammer investigations started out to, you know, like, root out the deep state, um, unfortunately, they failed because there were so many, you know, like inconsistencies in trial evidence, so many questions surrounding the, you know, like the legal procedure. Um, a lot of times there were questions about uh, the evidence. Was it planted? Was it authentic? Uh, but in the end, um, what these investigations managed to do, well, they, they did not uncover the deep state. Uh, but they put um, hundreds of military officers um, and, you know, like journalists and other secular actors who were aligned with the military, the Kemalist secularist establishment, um, hundreds of them, they put them behind bars. So throughout this process, and the, the, the political um, process, uh, the, the legitimization process was, uh, was very much active, uh, especially by pro-government media in Turkey in 2007, 8, 9. Um, so this was um, successful in kind of declawing the military. Um, and um, now looking back, a lot of Turkish political analysts say, you know, like, yes, they managed to, um, you know, um, silence the military um, by putting these generals behind bars and generally by creating um, a very, very um, effective climate of fear. Um, so yes, that's why the military is no longer the military it, it used to be. Now, um, 
On one hand, this is good news because, you know, um, we definitely don't want the military to be the one who, you know, like swoops in and democratizes the country, so, you know, like by way of coups. Uh, but uh, we also don't, I mean, personally speaking, um, I'm not trying to whitewash the military, but um, Ergenekon and Sledgehammer trials were very, very p problematic and were, you know, like very highly politicized and instrumentalized by uh, by the AKP. So they didn't, you know, like wipe out or uncover the deep state at all. Um, but it kind of served um, the AKP and its um, other Islamist um, allies to kind of, you know, like achieve this this ultimate end. What um, a lot of people uh, uh, refer to as, you know, like um, the end of the military tutelage. And um, the problematic thing with those investigations was that the Turkish public um, was presented with this false choice. Uh, this was this was the narrative. If you are, you know, supporting the military generals, um, then that means you're um, siding with the military fascism. Um, so any criticism aimed at these trials, the procedures, were seen as, oh, you are quote unquote coup enthusiasts. Um, and support given for the prosecutors, you know, like the um, investigations, and more generally AKP and Erdogan, um, was presented to the public as, okay, you are true Democrats. You want to democrat democratize the country. So that false choice was, was I think, very damaging. I don't know if this answers your yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so going back to, um, I will need your help. Uh, yes, the volunteer, the, um, the polling monitors, right? Um, I have not talked to them personally, but I'm, you know, like um, um, scheduling some interviews um, with them. But this was a very, very. They started with a, as a very small group, um, and I'm. I don't. I, I don't know if they've been penetrated, uh, or if the AKP thinks that they are worthy of penetrating. Um, as I said. Um, the opposition, political opposition to the AKP is, is very ossified, um, is very ineffective. So probably this is something that they do not even maybe think worthy of. And there was one more question, I'm the sorry. The VPN thing, whether Turkey might go after the VPNs the way the Chinese have. Um, yes, they're definitely, you know, like um, taking a page from the Russian and the um, Chinese playbook. Will they go after the VPNs? You know, I would say, I would hazard to guess. But um, two days ago, they, um, the government, uh, a government agency, um, practically seized a bank, um, a, a commercial bank that is owned and operated by Erdogan's former allies, now their enemies. Um, so you would always think that you know, like, oh yes, they are really. Uh, you know, like neoliberals at heart, they are not going to do anything that harms the Turkish economy because as long as the economy is, you know, like strong enough that keeps their, you know, like voter base um, alive, right? That's what energizes them. Uh, but then um, just because they want to go after a political foe, um, they take over a bank, which, you know, like sends terrible signals to international markets and analysts. So I'm kind of befuddled, you know. Um, you always think that you know, like, no, they're never going to do that because they don't want to hurt the the markets. They won't go far, yes, and but they do. They do. <laughs> so, yeah. hi. I just have two questions. The first question pertaining to the role of social media, I cannot help but notice some of the interesting parallels mm -hmm. between the case the case of Turkey mm -hmm. and the case of Egypt, mm -hmm. taking into account the surge in social media use and also seventy percent population under the age of thirty five. Yes safety valve notion, mm -hmm. and also the way to get around some of the uh, media shutdowns mm -hmm. and crackdowns. But I would be interested uh, to hear more about some of the differences and distinctions, in your mm -hmm. opinion, mm -hmm. between the uniqueness of the Turkish case, per se, and the case of Egypt, or even more you know, broadly, some mm -hmm. of the uh, Arab Spring countries, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, it seems that there is some kind of peculiarity and ambivalence with the Turkish case in particular. Mm -hmm. On one hand, it is being seen from the Western perspective and perspective of liberals, as you know, there are so many push and pull mechanisms and a lot of crackdowns on, mm -hmm. you know, freedom of the press and media and freedom more generally. But in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, the Turkish example is hailed as an example of success of a new liberal Islamist state. You know, Erdogan is seen as a reform hero who was able to push the country forward in the road of, you know, 
uh, economic reform, mm -hmm. uh, solve many of the country's problems, and open the door for more freedom. How can you explain this kind of ambivalence, please? Mm -hmm. That's um, actually what I'm trying to do in the book. Um, and that's why <laughs> I'm not going to, well, that, that it could be a longer conversation, but just to give you a, a, a very, you know, like a, a brief and hopefully, you know, like helpful answer, that's why I'm calling the book Turkish Model? Um, and I'm arguing that the Turkish model never really existed to begin with. This was, you know, like um, during and after the Arab Spring, well, even before Arab Spring, you know, like um, if you look at, um, um, the Bush administration after September 11, Turkey was always, you know, like portrayed as this, you know, like moderate um, Muslim country um, that, you know, like the Arabs could take as a model. Um, but um, Turkish model, um, and I don't know if Erdogan is still popular um, in, in in the Arab um, world because I've been looking at some, you know, like polls. Um, it, you know, like his popularity and the popularity of Turkey. Um, as the supposed model was very high in 2011, and then you know, like it started going down, especially with what's happening, you know, like and um, Syria. Uh, the fact that you know, like Turkey's um, Syrian foreign policy miserably um, failed. Um, so I'm, I, I, I have to look into that further. I'm not sure that he is still hailed. Um, there was a time when he was very popular, especially after he. Um, you know, um, expressed very favorable opinions about, you know, like views uh, at Davos about Palestine codes. And, you know, like he basically left the stage when he was talking to, um, I think, the Israeli prime minister. Um, so that was, I think, a high moment where he was seen as, you know, like, oh, here's a Muslim leader taking on Israel and speaking on behalf of, you know, like all Arabs. Um, so the, the relationship between Turkey and, um, you know, like Arab Spring, I think, is is kind of complicated, and I say that um, that Turkish never Turkish model never really existed because um, Turkish model in the Western imaginary was kind of you know like imposed by Western uh, policymakers as this um, neoliberal um, economic system that successfully blended um, Muslim values or uh, Islam with Western um, democracy. Now that's kind of like the you know like nice shiny veneer. Uh, but actually, if you look at um, all the domestic um, dynamics that have been shaping, you know, like Turkish politics, at least since the 1980s, um, that's uh, that that I find very problematic uh, because uh, a uh, the, uh, the, the problematic because of the this the so-called marriage of you know, Islam and democracy. Uh, because it, it, we kind of assume that, you know, like, oh, yes, Turkey is, is, is truly democratic. Um, so that's what I'm arguing against. No, um, the state is still very much authoritarian, has always been. It's very state-centric. And it's always the priorities of the state, not necessarily individual rights and liberties. Um, so. Um, that's one of my arguments. I don't know if this answers your question, but um, yeah, I um, um, and also to say that uh, you know, uh, oh, the Turkish model was uh, great, and then what happened? Um, no, Turkish model was was not really there. Um, so the relationship between um, Turkey and you know Arab Spring. Developments. Turkey had a very, you know, like the AKP had a very, very um, contingent response to Arab Spring. So they called on. I'm sure you're familiar with this. They called on Mubarak to step down. But um, what when you know, like um, uh, uprisings were happening in Tunisia, they were quiet for a long time. They didn't even know how to respond. And then with Libya, they just you know like flip flopped. Uh, they said, you know, like, oh, we should, you know, like, let Libyans decide. And then the next day, literally the next day, oh, you know, like, NATO should start, you know, like, bombing. So um, it's very contingent. That's why I shy away from saying, you know, like, this is how Turkey responded to Arab Spring. Because in Tunisia, especially Libya and Egypt, it was very, very much different. And, of course, Syria is altogether a different story. I think I should read the book. That's what I should do. <laughs> but, uh, for the first part of the question about the role of social media in particular, oh, okay. mm -hmm. do you see anybody particular distinctions between Turkish case and let's say for example the Egyptian case or the case of other Arab Spring countries? Um, that's why I should talk to you more <laughs> because I was going to ask you about the Egyptian case. Um, 
Well, you know, um, if we take Gezi as, you know, like the, the, the tipping point, right, in terms of this explosion of, or, or burdening of, you know, like social media, and kind of compare it to Tahrir Square, um, the, um, I, I think that the motivations were very much different, right? When people took out the streets during Gezi protests all across Turkey, they weren't necessarily, well, perhaps if some were calling for the government and Erdogan to resign, but they were initially prompted by very much di very different reasons than, than the Egyptians, right? Mm -hmm. um, it didn't start necessarily as this ideological anti-Erdogan movement, mm -hmm. right? It basically started as a small group of environmental activists, 20 or 30 of them, because they were not happy with the local government's plan to tear down this park, Gizeh Park in central um, Istanbul. Uh, but with the uh, police crackdown, burning of their tents, and you know, like heavy um, gassing of, of, of protesters, then it kind of you know, like grew into something larger. And it brought together several different groups. Um, so it was not necessarily driven by one single ideological position, because there were environmentalists, you know, soccer fans, feminists, LGBT groups, uh, you know, um, Kurd, Kurds. Uh, so it was a very uh, broad um, group of, of um, I would say, positions, political positions um, against, you know, the AKP's uh, privatization of public spaces against their, you know, like environmentally dis destructive policies, um, against, you know, like basically Erdogan's personal style of this kind of, you know, like authoritarian um, leader. But it didn't start out as, you know, like I believe, as far as I'm familiar with the Egyptian case, uh, what prompted the protests in the first place were, were very much um, different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I was fascinated by many things, but one is the Western imaginary mm -hmm. and uh, the idea of what, how the Western imaginary changes and also, in a way, your role in addressing the Western imaginary and maybe changing the Western mm -hmm. imaginary. But the other thing is, what was the effect of the Western imaginary? Mm -hmm. In other words, you have the State Department funding NGOs, you have this question of, are they the enemy of the state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So, do you look at how the State Department implemented its version of the Western imaginary mm -hmm. or tried to sustain it mm -hmm. as a way of buttressing and pushing the, the Turkish mm -hmm. society in a certain mm -hmm. way? Well, um, I'm not sure I can speak to the State Department specifically, but I can speak to, you know, like overall American foreign policy concerning um, Turkey. <laughs> um, so, you know, like um, I think from the... Reagan era uh, onto, you know, like the Bush administration. And when, you know, like Hillary Clinton during Arab uprisings, you know, um, she put forward the Turkish model. And then when Obama visited Turkey, he said, you know, like, oh, this is a country between the East and the West, you know, like brings together all these, you know, like Western and Eastern Muslim values together. Um, and I think uh, when I criticize the Western narrative, obviously I'm looking at the, the Western media coverage. Uh, but obviously, um, I think American foreign policy and U.S. lawmakers, uh, together with, you know, like Western journalists and political analysts, um, you know, 2011 during the uprisings, um, and also when Erdogan um, came to power in early uh, 2000s, there was this, you know, like euphoria. Uh, oh, look, here is a Muslim reader, here, here's a Muslim government, and they are doing, you know, like all these European Union harmonization reforms, they are doing legal reforms. Um, so there was much um, um, celebration. The economy is booming. Uh, but, you know, like, I think this was a good narrative, and this was a hopeful narrative to latch on to, uh, because uh, it was also very you know, like easy, I think, for Western journalists uh, to look at these, again, those binary oppositions, you know, like Islam versus secularism and, you know, like Kemalism versus this new, you know, like um, Turkish model of, of democracy. It was simple, easy to understand, and it didn't really... Uh, they didn't really bother to look at all the, you know, like the complex dynamics, kind of... I guess the question is, did it go beyond narrative? In other words... Are there funding efforts or funding of NGOs mm. or, in other words, narrative is one thing, but yes, implementing okay. narrative. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know. I should look into that. Mm -hmm. But um, I know Brookings Institution has done a lot of work 
uh, on Turkey. So if you look at, you know, like their earlier reports, um, it's, it's all, you know, like, beaming about about the Turkish model um, and um, 2011 it was all about this you know like vibrant Turkish democracy um, and now it's it's completely different um, and a lot of them are, are now you know this also uh, applies to Turkish liberals who gave you know unconditional support to the AKP in, in their you know um, um, in their early years uh, for their European reforms and, you know, like liberalizing the economy, uh, but just, you know, like overlooking several other um, um, issues. Uh, it was very interesting when you talk about <coughs> the integration of the uh, Turkish uh, economy with the international e-commerce and e-government services and stop them from shut down mm -hmm. the internet model. And um, I think it's a dual side blade because when Google has an office in Istanbul, you can go and pressure them, say, that, okay, mm -hmm. shut down that. Yeah. Uh, because, for example, in the case of Iran, one of the side effects of the international sanction is Iran economic system completely isolated, mm -hmm. so they feel free every time shut down the yeah. system. Yeah. And that was one of the motivations they come up with this national intranet system. So, mm -hmm. okay, the banks can work inside, we can shut yeah. down in Excel. Mm -hmm. And... But on the other side, there's no Google Office that you can go say that, yeah. give me this. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see in future I mean, this integration of Turkey with the larger mm -hmm. developments in the ICT field mm -hmm. might affect the direction of this? Yes, I think, you know, like having an office in Turkey and this, you know, like inter integration into global financial markets is, is, is very important and that, you know, like... I think that's what makes um, Turkey, say, from you know, very much different from um, Iran. Um, and um, last year, um, there was a lot of pressure on Twitter to open um, an office in Turkey, um, so that they could, you know, like take responsibility, um, so that they could be subject to the Turkish law. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, what is uh, what the, the government officials do not say openly is. Um, so they can, you know, when they open an office, they can pay um, taxes in Turkey, right? Um, so that's what they wanted to do with Google. And a lot of time, uh, and um, um, this I found um, in some, you know, like um, obscure references when I was looking at the government official statements about the YouTube ban. Um, so 2007, 2008, a lot of people were thinking myself included, yeah, this, they're doing this because, you know, like they're really upset about the Atatürk videos um, and, and, and whatnot. Um, then I talked to the, some people, you know, like ISP providers and, and whatnot and Internet activists, and they said, you know, well, actually, they're just, you know, like strong arming Google um, by way of, you know, like shutting down YouTube and then some Google services making them unavailable to pressure them so they can come and open an office and they just want to, you know, like make them pay taxes because, you know, like Turkey is obviously a huge market for them. So I think there's that interesting, you know, like economic aspect of it, but they obviously don't talk about it. It's just, you know, like um, on the outside, um, it's like, oh, Turkish government against a big Western um, corporation. I was wondering, could you go back? Oh, I'm sorry. I just uh, wanted to follow up with, with another general question. That is, you, you keep referring to these internal dynamics in Turkey. Where is that pushing Turkey? Uh, you say Turkey has been authoritarian, so nothing new, but you're suggesting that there is something. What, what direction is Turkey moving in? in your opinion? Yeah. Uh, not a very good place. Um, because um, Erdogan has amassed so much power um, and they have pretty much taken control of the state institutions. Not that they were, um, you know, like democratic, democratic and independent to begin with. Um, so it used to be that they were usually um, the state institutions, courts, state bureaucracy, bureaucracy uh, were populated uh, by um, Kemalist and secularist actors. Um, and so there has been this shift. 
what the AKP said they were doing was, okay, we're going to democratize these institutions. We're going to make them independent. Uh, but what happened instead was, um, they were, you know, like um, depopulated of the Kemalist secularist actors, you know, like judges, prosecutors, state bureaucrats, top level administrators and whatnot. And instead came in, you know, like the, <clears throat> um, the more conservative Islamist pro-AKP um, proxies. So um, one thing that um, I find very problematic is against this, this false choice, right? Um, so uh, and it is, they are still, you know, like furthering this, this, the same argument that, yes, we are now, you know, like the military tutelage is over. Uh, we are no longer living in this military um, fascism um, and we are democratic. Um, so um, that, of course, hides these, uh, you know, um, hides the fact that uh, there has been this, 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 if you like, power shift from the military um, to AKP aligned um, um, circles, I'm going to say. And this includes not just, you know, like political actors, but also a new business elite that's emerging. Um, because what happened with the um, transformation uh, um, under the AKP, um, during the AKP era, is not just the end of the military tutelage or, you know, like putting away the military generals behind bars and declawing the military um, and making, you know, like the threat of a military coup impossible, but also the power shift from um, a business elite that was very much aligned with the Kemalist secularist um, bureaucratic structures to this new, what um, um, they refer, what they call the Muslim bourgeoisie. Um, so their relationships with, I think, you know, like the AKP are very much important because they are the ones, you know, like getting all these state contracts and bids and privatization deals, which again is, you know, um, going back to um, your point is, is, is very, you know, like that's what makes, I think, Turkey very ambivalent and very peculiar uh, because on one hand, um, you have a government that is, you know, like um, doing a lot of privatization, uh, privatization of pu all public assets, um, um, very much uh, in line with the market logic, with um, the neoliberal principles. But it doesn't mean that the state is not important in Turkish economy. It still is. Um, so it's this strange mix of neoliberalism and state centrism, not only in uh, not only in politics, but also in, in, in the economy. Um, so I'm looking at these studies that, you know, like how much um, state money is being funneled um, by way of government agencies to um, pro-government, pro-Erdogan um, business um, entities, business corporations. And they usually tend to be um, the new emergent bourgeoisie um, in particular sectors like construction, energy, mining, um, that's where they're making their, you know, like millions of, of, of dollars. You're describing a kind of paradoxical situation. Yes. Moderniza economic modernization, political reactionary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and I think that. this... Um, Coexisting. Yes. Reinforcing each other. Exactly. And I think this is the experience of um, late modernizing countries um, as in Turkey. So uh, the, uh, the bourgeoisie, that statist, Kemalist bourgeoisie, um, after the establishment of the republic in 30s, 40s, especially 50s. It was kind of, you know, like uh, uh, nurtured by the state. Um, and now we are seeing the nurturing of a different, uh, of, a, of a more, you know, like Muslim bourgeoisie. So it's, it's not just this, you know, like political power um, shifting from, say, the military slash Kemalist secularist um, establishment to these new players, but also with it, the economic power, this, this new um, capitalism. There's a great new book um, called um, New Capitalism in Turkey. Um, I think it's also um, um, printed in English. Um, they show, you know, like they, they, um, they detail all these, you know, like um, intricate relationships between um, the locus of political power and economic power. Okay, I, I was wondering if you could go back to the slide with the 140 journals in, sure. the, in the boardroom. And I, I ask you to do this uh, just to follow up on the 
question of the Western imaginary. Mm -hmm. So this picture could be taken anywhere as far as I can see. We have mm -hmm. a, a group of nice, young, well-groomed uh, yeah. <laughs> activists on their MacBooks. Uh, we see all the Mac products around. Yep. Mm -hmm. and sort of modernist office space that yes. uh, looks very familiar mm -hmm. uh, and reassuring to us sitting here in this modernist uh, boardroom as well yes and so we could be on a skype session with these we could yeah uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> sure but, our um, friends but this um okay go ahead i'm sorry so so basically uh, uh at the outset of your uh, talk you also uh, suggested that you wanted to take a kind of a critical stance to the celebratory accounts of mm -hmm. the emancipatory potential of internet activism especially how it's been uh, used to explain Mm -hmm. uh, recent events in, in the Middle East and North Africa. And so I, I have a kind of a broader question uh, because I, I don't doubt uh, that Internet uh, usage has proliferated and that the mm -hmm. Turkish government has been actively uh, making efforts to, to block certain kind mm -hmm. of uh, Internet activity, websites, um, discourses, etc. But uh, in, in, in your view, I wonder if you could bring this back to tying it to broader uh, social movements in Turkey about what you see as the efficacy of internet activism, mm -hmm. uh, because the Gezi Park protests, in, in the end, what happened was because it brought under one roof uh, such a diversity of groups and opinions mm -hmm. and, and political struggles, uh, the diversity was both a source of its strength, but ultimately yes. a source of its a weakness in the end exactly. we didn't see it translate into a um, cohesive long-lasting broad mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. so um, uh, does internet activism matter for uh, social movements broadly speaking mm -hmm. do you think mm -hmm. okay um, yes I agree and uh, b but before I say um, more about that um, this picture you know like uh, was posted and taken by you know like these folks themselves so yeah it's not like you know like Western journal you know like walking into their office or observing them this is um, from their Twitter account um, but also I think it speaks volumes as to how you know like um, Turkish citizens think of themselves and you know like kind of construct that that identity yes you we are very much you know like westernized and you know like technologically adapt and hey you know like we are using all these you know like cool tools and you know like sitting at our you know like with our Macs and and, and everything you know like um, so yes that is um, that is a, a interesting and um, um, going back to this you know like this the cele celebration of the emancipation or you know like um, this this digital um, activism. Um, personally, I am. Um, uh, I'm. I'm. I'm not. You know, like celebrating. Yes, there is. You know, like something going on there. Uh, but is it effective? Is it going to be effective in the long run? Um, I'm not sure. I would like to say yes, but based on what I've seen and experienced so far, I'm. I. I don't think so, because. Um, in as much as you know, like I highlighted 140 journals and these, you know, like voting, um, voting volunteers and you know, like their their initiatives. We also need to keep in mind that these are very, very extremely, you know, like small pockets, right, of of dissent. Um, a couple of days ago, oh, I wish I included that. A couple of days ago, I I saw this, you know, like kind of Twitter map of of Turkey. So it's like this map of Turkey, you know, like uh, with um, particular provinces, you know, like being just lighting up with Twitter activity. And you could also see that, you know, like those are the provinces or the major cities like Istanbul, Ankara and Izmir that are and a few others, you know, like very small, smaller, you know, like perhaps dots. Right. But Istanbul was like big and the light. Um, those are also, you know, like um, um, in terms of, you know, like um, the economy more, you know, like advanced than other parts of the country. and. We're talking about, you know, like when we talk about, I think, Twitter activism, yes, there are millions of tweets and, you know, like um, thousands of Twitters or they have thousands of followers and whatnot. The numbers are very small um, considering, you know, like the overall population. Um, so I'm also, you know, like keeping, keeping that in mind. Um, it is small, but uh, although they're very small, I think they are still important. They deserve, you know, like attention. Um, but I, 
I, I, I'm just very careful not to, you know, like over celebrate them. I'm, I'm just saying, yes, they do exist. Something is happening. I don't know if this makes sense to you. Um, but over the years, you know, like as, as I observe and think about and write about Turkey, I've, I've grown very, you know, like cynical. Um, and um, so I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, like uh, be very cautious. Um, but I also feel that, you know, like I have a responsibility to acknowledge their existence. Um, and about Gizi, yes, unfortunately, you know, like Gizi was a turning, I think, turning point in Turkish politics, especially in terms of, you know, like um, civil movements and youth movements. Um, but did it crack up uh, to be what it was supposed to be or what it, we hoped it was going to be? I don't think so. So we talk about in, in the Turkish context, we talk about this Gezi spirit. Um, so I'm not really sure if the spirit is alive because the recent um, um, conflicts um, in southeastern Turkey regarding the Kurdish issue, I think that's going to be a litmus test for um, all activists who are involved in, in, in Gezi. So whether or not they support, you know, like Kurdish um, rights um, or not. So um, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know if this addresses your question. Thank you very much. And, uh, I think we should all be in the mood of both celebrating and being skeptical about celebrating. And, <laughs> yeah. and I hope that you come back after your book is published. Thank and you. There's, there's an appetite Hopefully. Thank you.